So we're going to talk about secondary angle closure glaucomas, uh, so as opposed to primary angle closure with relative pupillary block. Now, there are uh, two categories of secondary angle closure that we're going to talk about. The first is pupillary block mechanisms, uh, apart from primary, where you have the blockage of aqueous flow from the posterior chamber into the anterior chamber by something happening at the um, at the pupillary border, uh, adhesion to the lens or anything behind it, pseudophagic, sometimes even vitreous. Um, and then we'll talk about the non-pupillary block mechanisms uh, in even more detail. And um, this is where you have contracture of the angle by membranes. Um, sometimes you have something pushing from posteriorly to anteriorly, closing off, closing off the angle uh, structures and getting a secondary pressure elevation. Um, here are uh, listed really kind of uh, all together are uh, the reasons why you can get a secondary angle closure with a pupillary block. Um, in the emergency room especially, you'll see the phacomorphic glaucoma is coming in, people with kind of intumescent, very advanced cataracts. Um, you would tell them apart from a primary angle closure by looking at the contralateral eye, which if it were phacic, uh, would have an open angle. Um, and for these, uh, you could take the lens out, but many times the, uh, there's an acute situation with the pressure elevation, bring them to the ER, so you often do a laser iridotomy first, let the eye quiet down, let the pressure normalize, and then go ahead and take the cataract uh, out at a later time. Or if you're brave, you can take the cataract out, and obviously that would take care of the pupillary block right away as well. Um, then you have uh, reasons for the lens, the crystal lens, to kind of uh, sublux or dislocate and uh, block the pupil, um, sometimes uh, with trauma, uh, sometimes spontaneously from uh, a number of disease states like Marfan's, homocystinuria, microspherophagia, Will Marcosani. Um, and again, for these, uh, you do a laser uh, iridotomy to alleviate the block. Obviously, if you have a total subluxation of the crystal lens into the anterior chamber, uh, that you'd want to take out that causes problems not only with glaucoma, but also with corneal decompensation. And then uh, you can also surprisingly have a pupillary block with uh, aphakia or pseudophakia, um, uh, which many times is a surprise to you. So for example, you've done your complex uh, cataract extraction, you've decided to put an anterior chamber lens in, and you dutifully put in a surgical iridectomy, and lo and behold, you still have a pupillary block. Um, so you can see kind of here the iris billowing anteriorly, and you can see it a little bit better in this slit lamp view here that the iris is right up against the cornea. So there's something here in, uh, vitreous wise that's blocking um, the flow, and you can see the, the optic of the IOL is perfectly sealing off the pupil. So if you do a laser iridotomy, then you can see, again, this marked opening, and the, there's the iridotomy here, and you can see that the angle uh, opens with the uh, chamber deepening and the pressure normalizing. Uh, this is a gentleman who came in, uh, who's actually uh, somebody that I saw, and uh, he fell off a ladder. He was a little bit of a drinker, um, and he subluxed his lens, and you can see uh, there's a a nice seal here with vitreous coming around uh, superiorly here, uh, a sealing at the pupillary border there, and you have the lens coming forward, sealing off the pupillary border here, and with pressures in the 50s. And with the laser iridotomy, you can see that the lens just falls right back after the laser iridotomy, which you see here. Um, so with, without a pupillary block, uh, we'll go through some of the um, causes for that with membrane, membrane contractures, uh, kind of pulling up iris up against the angle, and also kind of the um, anterior displacement of the lens iris diaphragm uh, for a variety of reasons. Neovascular glaucoma is something that you're going to see um, throughout your careers. This, unfortunately, is uh, not that rare. Uh, we have a lot of diabetics. We have patients with central renal vein occlusion, sometimes ocular ischemia with carotid uh, stenosis. And um, in the beginning, these are very subtle when you start developing the vascular glaucoma. Um, and you see here these really 
rampaging, huge, dilated uh, rubios, rubiotic vessels on the iris surface. But in the beginning, they're very, very tiny little tufts of the pupillary border um, that you have to look at very carefully with high power to see. And also, uh, sometimes you won't even see anything on the iris with the slit lamp. However, if you look gonioscopically, you can see fine neovascular vessels crossing the angle. Sometimes it's the very first manifestation of anterior segment neovascularization. Uh, is a precursor to having uh, angle closure glaucoma develop with neovascularization. Um, you all know that uh, treating this uh, it can be very effective if you catch it promptly enough, uh, if you can reduce the kind of um, ischemic uh, factors by doing panretinal photocoagulations, uh, doing anti-VEGF injections. Um, you can get marked regression very quickly of these vessels, and if you catch it early enough, there's a great prognosis. Uh, on the other hand, um, sometimes you catch it too late, um, and then you have to treat this with the usual aqueous suppressants, uh, steroids, cycloplegia, and sometimes even surgical intervention like <clears throat> trabeculectomy tube shunts or ciliodestructive procedures to control the intraocular pressure. So as I said, you know, uh, uh, you always want to be looking for the cause of any anterosegment vascularization, and it's really either going to be diabetic or CRVO. Those are the, by far and away the leading causes. But also think about ocular ischemia syndrome, think about carotid disease. Sometimes if you have tumors, uh, vasculitis, longstanding renal detachment, those are less common uh, reasons for developing anterosegment vascularization. And as I said, sometimes it's very hard to see especially in brown irides, more so than uh, light irides, the neovascularization that develops on the anterior, lens, uh, on anterior iris surface. And again, you want to look really at the pupillary margin here for the kind of tufts that seem almost like little dilated vessels right at the pupillary margin. Gonioscopically, um, again, very hard to see, but there are these little tiny meandering uh, blood vessels crossing the angle meaning it goes across the meshwork, anterior to the meshwork, which you typically won't see. And these vessels can be separated from normal vessels that you see that are uh, variants of uh, normal vascularity in the angle in that they're branching and meandering. Uh, usually normal vessels don't branch much, and they're, they're heading somewhere on a straight line. And then after the neovascularization, uh, you see these uh, peripheral anterior sneaking develop. Now, if you go in histologically and you look at the open angle here, many times there's a membrane already forming in this area. And the reason the PAS develops is that the contracting membrane, the fibrovascular membrane, draws the iris up. Because the membrane is also on the iris surface here. It's not just in the angle. So with that contracture, it just pulls the iris up and covers the angle. And when you look in, you see these broad areas of, of PAS forming here. And, you know, once you start having this develop, you're in trouble with that patient, especially if you've covered up the majority of the angle, um, because even if you do the PRP or anti-VEGF injections, you're not going to really uh, get the angle uncovered in these regions, obviously. Um, and just quickly, you know, uh, the theory behind getting the neovascularization anteriorly is that with the ischemic insult to the eye, especially posteriorly, uh, you get the diffusion of these uh, angiogenic uh, fast, uh, factors, uh, the vascular endothelial growth factor, and that's what all the anti-VEGF um, kind of uh, targeting uh, has been done for retina, is to inject uh, things that will counteract these angiogenesis uh, factors. Uh, but once they get anteriorly, then you get uh, all these uh, kind of new vessel formations, which normally does not happen in the eye, and then these cr cr cross across the angle, get PS, and then you get uh, a reduction in aqueous outflow. So again, uh, treatment, um, uh, before you get neovascularization in the angle and secondary glaucoma, um, the retina folks are, are fantastic at kind of keeping uh, this in check if caught early by doing uh, the heavy PRP and anti-VEGF injections routinely. Uh, so if you do all this beforehand, then you rarely get to uh, people presenting with spontaneous hyphemas, rampant uh, neovascularization. But if you do have a secondary glaucoma, the best therapies are going to be aqueous suppressants. Uh, those can be like beta blockers, uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, alpha agonists, uh, less so with prostaglandin analogs, and um, certainly myotics aren't really very uh, good in this setting either. 
Uh, for comfort, we use atropine and steroids, and those often can make a big difference to somebody with a very hot and uncomfortable eye. It can be a really a dramatic improvement in symptomatology and quieting the eye down. And then if the pressure still remains elevated, then we have to decide about whether we do filtration surgery or cilia ablation. Um, so again, early on, uh, if you can catch it um, and you treat very aggressively uh, with anti-VEGF and PRP and the pressure is still elevated, but you've gotten good regression, um, then you could do a trabeculectomy with mitomycin C. Um, and in this setting, you probably don't want to do an iridectomy, and many times you can get by without an iridectomy with the TRAB. But in this uh, situation especially, doing an iridectomy can cause a lot of bleeding. So uh, even though you have regression of these vessels, it's still pretty vascular, and if you do an iridectomy, even in a normal eye can bleed, but especially here, the eye can fill up with blood. So you probably don't want to do uh, a peripheral iridectomy. Uh, if you have more kind of prominent um, PAS and the pressure's really up there and you didn't have total regression of the endovascularization, you really didn't have time, um, then a tube shunt is probably the way to go to control the intraocular pressure. If you've really uh, gone to the very end, meaning somebody's presented with very poor vision, either from the glaucoma or the vascular non-perfusion of the posterior segment, then you're talking about really uh, trying to control them without doing too much surgically and cilial ablation, uh, either with cyclocryotherapy or laser cyclophotocoagulation, is the way to go. And if the eye is really painful and blind totally, uh, you can even consider using retrobulbar alcohol or phenothiazines that are now used also for pain management as a retrobulbar injection. Um, there have been people comparing tube shunts versus cilial ablation over the years. Um, They've been more of kind of like, you know, we've done uh, 50 and somebody else has done 50 of that, and how do they compare? But uh, here at Wills years ago, um, one of the research fellows kind of did a uh, matched, not a randomized perspective trial, but a, a kind of historical cohort of people uh, who had a, a tube shunt versus people that had a um, transcleral cyclophotocoagulation. So um, this was a nice comparison, seeing how... Uh, eyes that had reasonable, some vision remaining, how they fared with the two approaches. One, reducing, obviously, aqueous flow by cilia ablation, and the other one, helping out flow with the tube shunt. And um, the mean follow-up here was uh, almost two years, and you can see the success rate was about uh, twice uh, in the tube shunt as it was in the cilia ablative group, uh, 38% versus 67% by the criteria listed here. And this has uh, been traditionally a very difficult type of glaucoma years ago to treat. Uh, back literally 30, 40 years ago, a lot of these eyes uh, ended up being enucleated. They ended up being NLP and enucleated, and that's very rare today. So this is a fairly aggressive glaucoma that used to be difficult to treat, but with all the modalities now, we have a pretty good chance, but it's not in the category of a you know, prime open-end glaucoma. And you see also that when looking at people that go to no light perception, for whatever reason, um, it, almost half in the slow blade of group ended up with NLP uh, as opposed to 17%. So um, when we're faced with making a decision for a patient with good vision uh, still, we almost always err on the side of helping outflow uh, with either a TRAB or a tube as opposed to slow ablation. Um, and tube shunts are, uh, were originally developed, actually, for situations like neovascular glaucomas, kind of refractory glaucomas. And they have evolved a little bit over time in terms of how we put them in and tying them off so that you don't go to a pressure of zero necessarily and get a big supracortal hemorrhage like you see here in this patient with neovascular glaucoma. Um, so, you know, when you're going from a super high pressure and you put a tube in and there's no valve, which were the case for all the original tubes, um, pressure would be zero. And uh, many times you'd end up with a supracortal hemorrhage with that big change in the pressure gradient. But now we tie the tubes off and we can kind of let the tube uh, open up gradually with the suture ligature dissolving using a Vicryl, or you have valve shunts now like the Ahmed, which make it a little bit safer. But nevertheless, it's still kind of a high-risk procedure in, in, in these eyes, and you have to be ready for a lot of problems, whether they're hypotony with the pressure being too low, uh, in choroidal fusion, supercoil hemorrhages, flat chambers, or having the pressure uh, fairly high for a while if you've tied off the tube, uh, waiting for the uh, ligature to dissolve. Um, 
using uh, lasers are really kind of uh, two ways you can approach a cilia ablation. And uh, many of you probably won't even see cyclocryotherapy done, which used a cryoprobe and uh, disoblation. And the reason you won't see it as much uh, nowadays, even though it did work in the old days through doing cyclocryo, is that it's much more destructive than laser. With laser, we're a little bit more precise, a little bit better control, uh, and less likely, hopefully, to lead to tysis, uh, we think. So uh, there are two ways you can do the laser. One is uh, externally, uh, using a diode laser. So this is transscleral, and this is uh, the unit that the retina folks use also for um, uh, laser procedures, but we have a special probe that hooks in here called the G probe, G for glaucoma, or actually it's named for Dr. Gasterland, who is a glaucoma specialist from Washington who developed this probe, and um, you apply this um, with the patient's supine, typically in the operating room, because it's a painful to do without really good block or having the patient under, under um, kind of uh, sedation. And you then apply the laser with this probe directly through the sclera, and you get these uh, burns and uh, ablation of the ciliary body in the area that you uh, aim with this probe. The other approach is to be uh, even a little bit more precise, and that's aiming a laser right at the ciliary processes. And how do you do this? Well, you have to enter the eye, and that's what this uh, endolaser CPC does. So you have an endoscope here. You've inflated the eye with viscoelastic, and you slip this probe in, and you actually see this view of the ciliary processes. And you aim the laser there, and as you're aiming the laser and stepping on the foot pedal, you're looking at a TV monitor, and you see these um, ciliary processes just turn white and shrivel uh, with the application of a laser. And you treat as many of these as you can. You can't do it for 360 if you've got one incision, so you often have to make two incisions to get most of the ciliary processes if you want to do 360. 360 does give you better pressure control than 180, but also then you worry about developing tysis, which is always a concern with cilia ablation. So a lot of people end up doing just 270 degrees and seeing how the patient uh, does. Obviously, this is um, an invasive procedure. You're making an incision. You have the risk of all sorts of things happening, including endophthalmitis. But uh, some people like this approach because it has a more precise, lower energy uh, delivery with the laser to the ciliary body. Um, other reasons uh, for having a contracture in the angle um, and getting a secondary angle closure is ice syndrome, irritocorneal endothelial syndrome. Our own Ralph Eagle here at Wills is one of the pioneers for kind of lumping together three different entities that were described by different folks. Chandler syndrome, which is the most common, essential iris atrophy, and iris nevus syndrome are thought to be all a kind of a continuum of, of the same problem. And they look sometimes very, very different. So for Chandler syndrome is, you know, the least obvious. You know, you see a little bit maybe of pupillary distortion, some corneal abnormality uh, in terms of guttata, but really sometimes it's really subtle and you can't really see anything at the slit lamp. It's when you do your gonioscopy that you see the classic findings in the angle with adhesions that tip you off that it's ice syndrome. Essential iris atrophy is pretty prominent with stretch holes and uh, looks like people have had iridectomies, um, but nobody's done any surgery in the eye. Uh, so a really pretty dramatic uh, slit lamp presentation. And iris nevus syndrome, uh, you have all these little multiple nevi, what look like nevi on the iris, but they're really actually not truly nevi. They're little pinched areas of contracture of the iris by membrane, making them look like nevi. Um, what's classic about this is that it's unilateral. There are very rare exceptional reports of bilateral eye syndrome, but 99.99% uh, .99 of the time, uh, this is going to be a unilateral problem. Typically in people presenting at age 20 to 50, more women than men. Uh, some folks have thought that there's some viral etiology with this. Um, both Epstein-Barr virus and uh, herpes simplex have been implicated, and uh, I don't think that's definitive, but it's uh, suggestive with some of the titers that have been drawn in the past. Uh, what's really key in, in, in this is uh, gonioscopically. When you look in, you're going to see some really high PAS and the other eye is going to be completely open angle. And, and you look at it and you go, wow, you know, this is either inflammatory with that high a PAS, and the patient has no inflammation, so you kind of rule that out. Uh, and you think of eye syndrome. Um, when you look at the cornea, it kind of looks like you have uh, these very fine guttata. They're a little bit finer than the typical guttata. 
If you do speculum microscopy, they'll show you that the, there's kind of pleomorphism and it's abnormal on speculum microscopy. Uh, and there's also a lower cell count. Treatment for this is going to be like you with the neovascular glaucoma is aqueous suppressants, and then you end up doing incisional surgeries, trabs or tubes. Doing an iridotomy, either a laser iridotomy or laser trabeculoplasty has no place here, just like with neovascular glaucoma because it's not a pupillary block, and also the angle is covered with a membrane, so doing a laser trabeculoplasty is not going to be helpful either. What's interesting with this is that if you have a trabeculectomy and you have a very nicely functioning trabeculectomy with good pressure control, and then several years later the pressure goes up out of the blue, pressure 10, 10, 10, and then all of a sudden it's 38. And you look and they have a great looking bleb and you go, I don't understand why the pressure's up. Well, what the, what's happened is that there's a membrane that forms, this endothelial membrane with eye syndrome, which covers the anterior segment, the iris, the angle, and that's where you get glaucoma but also covers the sclerostomy. And if you go in with the YAG laser and, and actually blast right in the hole that was created with the trabeculectomy, the sclerostomy, you can actually almost immediately recover function of the blood. So these are one of the few instances where doing a YAG laser revision internally can restore function to a filtration blood that's been working for years. Because the cornea is abnormal in these, uh, uh, these eye syndrome patients, many of them end up having uh, a corneal transplant done at some point. So here again are the really almost pathognomonic uh, peripheral anterior sneakia. The, they're so high. You know, here's kind of where the meshwork is over here. You can see how high these go. I mean, there's a, there's a membrane, endothelial sheet that's covering the anterior segment, and it's everywhere, and it's pulling the iris way up against the cornea and covering the angle. There aren't too many things that are going to give you that kind of look. So here again, um, here's somebody with uh, kind of more of a Chandler's version, a little bit of correctopia, um, but, you know, not much else here. Here you see some holes, um, uh, kind of more essential iris atrophy. Here's somebody with more kind of dramatic essential iris atrophy. Almost looks like somebody did uh, either a surgical iridectomy there or trauma with a rupture, and these patients obviously have no history. These look very similar uh, to another entity, um, Rieger's. Uh, which obviously is congenital. It's a developmental anomaly. And how you tell them apart right off the bat is that these people are born that way, of people with Riegers, and it's bilateral. Um, so if you have somebody that didn't have this presentation when they were younger, they developed later, and it's only one eye, it's not Riegers. Uh, it's eye syndrome. Um, if somebody presents to you with a, a marked pressure elevation and a uh, shell anterior chamber, the other eye has a, really an open angle, you always want to think about things posteriorly pushing things forward. So, for example, tumors, melanomas, uh, METs, retinoblastoma, medial epithelioma. Um, there have been cases reported, for example, in children of having tube shunts that had medial epithelioma missed uh, and they had seeding. Um, and you always worry about that. If you end up doing surgery on, on these eyes and they have tumors and you seed into the orbit, obviously that's not a good thing. So you want to make sure that you've ruled out posterior segment pathology, especially uh, kind of tumors uh, as a possible reason for something being pushed anteriorly. Um, also, there are going to be other uh, situations like a spontaneous hemorrhage. Uh, years ago, one of the residents here, Sam Pesson, uh, when he was a resident, collected a series in the glaucoma service and also in retina of people presenting with uh, pressure is super high, like 70, uh, tremendous pain, having a history of uh, mild kind of AMD, uh, uh, and then being on some form of anticoagulation, uh, like warfarin or aspirin, who spontaneously have a sub-retinal uh, supercoidal hemorrhage with this kind of mass effect, uh, creating a shallow chamber and a secondary angle closure uh, glaucoma. And these often can be very difficult to treat uh, with a poor prognosis. So you always, when you're, when you're, when you're doing going ask, when you see these kind of uh, lumps here, you want to make sure you know what's behind it. You can do some more evaluation uh, in terms of getting uh, scans like a, a UBM uh, to look at this a little bit more carefully. Uh, if you see something that doesn't look right coming out of the angle, uh, like a melanoma, obviously you want to work that up more extensively. Uh, inflammatory disease and secondary angle closure is uh, pretty darn common. Um, you can have this from 
um, ocular uh, uveitis, but also systemic uh, related problems as well. So with ocular problems, uh, Fuchs heterochromic cyclitis, Posner Schlossmann, glaucomacytic crisis, in other words, pars planitis. I don't think any of you are going to probably in your career see sympathetic ophthalmia, but that's always kind of on the differential. Uh, in terms of systemic disease, um, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, unfortunately, is not that rare. Um, sarcoidosis is not that rare. A little bit more rare are things like VKH, Bechet's, and Crohn's leading to a uveitis and a secondary glaucoma. And then infectious etiologies certainly are on the list as well, including things like herpes, um, HIV, syphilis, and toxo. Uh, in terms of uveitis leading to glaucoma, there are different kinds of reports in terms of the prevalence uh, that you would see um, in one series, uh, there, about a third of the patients develop a secondary glaucoma uh, in association with pediatric uveitis within a relatively short period of time. Uh, JRA um, is one of the uh, leading uh, causes in children with uh, uveitis leading to glaucoma. And also, if they've received steroid injections, they're more likely, uh, whether it's the steroid or they're just a more kind of aggressive uh, uveitic uh, situation or both, um, have been associated with the development of glaucoma. <coughs> and more in adults, um, the rate isn't quite as high. It's been reported up to about 11% after kind of a similar time period, about five years. Uh, at my last count, there are at least 60 known causes of uveitis, and you want to do the usual workup. And I don't think the percentage has changed. It's around 50% is the figure that's tossed around that you'll find any systemic uh, association or abnormal serologies or other testing that will point to something else uh, other than a purely uh, limited ocular uh, uveitis. There are several mechanisms whereby you can develop a glaucoma. Uh, you can have uh, a kind of pupillary block. Um, if you get a lot of adhesion at the pupillary margin to the lens or, or uh, IOL, you can get an iris bombay and uh, a secondary angle closure. Sometimes you get it just from the inflammation itself, and um, the PAS, typically with the inflammation, the inflammatory debris, you know, with gravity, it falls down. So you're going to get your PAS with inflammatory gook inferiorly. So if you see PAS forming inferiorly, uh, think of inflammation. If you see it superiorly, you think of primary angle closure. Um, that's where the angle is the narrowest. So, you know, with regular primary angle closure, superiorly, the earliest PAS. With inflammatory, you see it typically inferiorly. So you can get a secondary angle closure with just inflammation and PS, no pupillary block as well. Uh, with longstanding inflammation, you get uh, neovascularization, as we talked about before. And in some rare instances, you can get spontaneous uveal fusions and get, again, the mass effect pushing everything anteriorly, getting a, a secondary angle closure. Um, and sometimes you see, you know, nothing really looking at the eye. It's got a little bit of inflammation, but the pressure is like 60. A, a classic example of that is posner schlossmer or glaucoma cyclitic crisis, where, you know, there's minimal inflammation, but the pressure is sky high. So we assume that there's some type of trabeculitis and abnormality with outflow that can be alleviated with uh, suppression of the inflammation. And many times these patients can be treated simply medically. Um, and, you know, the steroid-induced uh, situation you always wonder, you know, is it the inflammation or is the steroid I'm using can control the inflammation? You obviously can't stop the steroids. If it's pretty well controlled, sometimes you go to steroids that are less likely to cause a pressure elevation, so there are weaker steroids uh, in the hopes that the pressure might be lower with the uh, lower steroid dose. Uh, the iris bombay uh, and the pupillary block that you get with inflammation is a little bit more difficult to treat sometimes than the other causes of pupillary block because these eyes are hot, and if you do a perfluorodectomy, even with a nice one with a, with a YAG laser and you've got a nice opening, uh, these can often seal off. Uh, these are the ones that often do close. Um, so sometimes we'll, we'll put in multiple PIs, especially in really hot eyes, sometimes in every quadrant if we're really having problems. And when you're doing these, remember, you want to do the iridotomies uh, to start with down below. And the reason is that if you do them up above and it bleeds and uh, there's all this blood inferiorly, then you can't really get a good view doing the iridotomy below. So if you plan on doing multiple iridotomies above and, and below uh, the horizontal meridian, you want to do the uh, inferior ones first. 
So here's a, a situation of somebody that had uh, inflammation after cataract surgery and had a pupillary block and uh, had iridotomies done um, and ended up having them done more than once. So this is not unusual with uvetis to have iridotomies done and then go back in and, and reopen them again. And like I said, you're going to look down below for these kind of uh, adhesions inferiorly. Um, sometimes you see some coating here with inflammatory debris as well. Um, treatment, uh, the usual anti-inflammatory treatments, obviously, cycloplegia uh, as well, and people sometimes even use uh, something more than topical, uh, subconj, uh, intravitreal, uh, oral. Uh, they've all been used uh, for the treatment of uveitis, depending on how aggressive it is. And then if you're still having trouble, then you end up doing a trabeculectomy uh, with antimetabolite or tube shunt, um, and if you have the pupillary block, obviously, a laser iodotomy. Just for historical interest here, you know, sometimes people think they know, you know, there's something that's going to work well. This is a patient that had a filtering surgery done, I think, 40 to 50 years ago, and they used to put gold in the subconscious space. They thought that would uh, help with people with the inflammation. So this is somebody that I took a picture of who had a gold injection subconch. Uh, so obviously we don't do that now, uh, but uh, they were thought to be helpful in the past. How does a trabeculectomy work uh, for uveitic glaucoma? Uh, the success rate's not bad. Uh, it still doesn't come up to the standards that you see with the primary glaucomas, uh, partly because with the chronic inflammation, you get subconjunctival fibrosis even years after the surgery if there's smoldering inflammation, and you can get a late pressure elevation. So, you know, in some of these series, it's anywhere from 62 to 82 percent. Not bad uh, going out several years. Uh, people have made a, a point of saying that maybe tube shunts are more successful, and they probably are. But being a glaucoma person, we always think, you know, if you do a tube shunt, it's really hard to do a TRAB as the second procedure. But if you do a TRAB and it fails, you can always do a tube shunt afterwards. So we tend to do here anyway uh, TRABs before tubes, but nobody would argue against going to a tube even as the primary operation because the success rate is a little bit higher uh, long term. Uh, in in um, doing a phaco trab, uh, also the results aren't too bad. So with the modern techniques of cataract surgery, and often these patients do have lens changes, the results can actually be reasonably good, as seen in this one study where there was 85% success at, uh, at roughly two years. Uh, doing a diode uh, laser cyclophoidic coagulation, uh, you know, there's some ridiculous people that come up with numbers like 100%. We, you, typically in glaucoma, we never have 100% in anything, but uh, this is just to show that some people do get reasonably good, res good uh, results with ciliary ablation. Here, we're really biased against doing that, uh, partly because we think that it causes more inflammation. There's more of an issue of going to hypotony. So um, we're more kind of in line with what uh, folks have described here as 32% success. On the other hand, if you have somebody that's not a candidate for incisional surgery, we often end up doing ciliary ablation. Specialist of concerns with uveitis, uh, prostaglandins have been associated with increasing inflammation, CME, and choroidal effusions. If you use intravitreal steroids, you often get a secondary pressure elevation. Uh, not unusual at all. And now with the implants that they have for giving steroid continuously over an extended period of time that are implanted inside the eye, there's a very high rate, up to 50%, requiring some type of glaucoma treatment, whether it's topical medications or even surgery. The condition that uh, we refer to as aqueous misdirection now used to be called malignant glaucoma. Malignant because a lot of the patients ended up having the eye removed. It was really not associated with good outcome years ago. Now it's almost unheard of to go to nucleation because we can treat this pretty effectively either medically or surgically. So the thought is that somehow aqueous is being misdirected posteriorly. And this often happens after glaucoma surgery, can happen after cataract surgery, and can happen after any intraocular surgery. So if you have a flat anterior chamber and associated with a flat retina and no history of pupillary block, and it doesn't look like a pupillary block, many times these chambers are completely flat, the thought is that somehow aqueous is being misdirected posteriorly instead of anteriorly. So we have to redirect the aqueous anteriorly. Sometimes you can do this simply by doing cycloplegia and aqueous suppressant and mannitol. About 50% of the time you go from a completely flat chamber to a fully deep chamber just with 
uh, aggressive medical therapy. Um, if that doesn't work, then you can actually disrupt sometimes the interhyloid face and pseudophakes with a uh, laser. You go in and actually laser the posterior capsule and the interhyloid face, and that allows aqueous to come anteriorly again. Or even more definitively, you have a parse plane of vitrectomy where you remove the vitreous, and then you also use the vitrectomy and go through the iris into the anterior chamber. So you have a definite pathway created that's broken the anterior hyaluronic face, uh, and that's almost 100% successful in alleviating um, aqueous misdirection. Uvula effusions, where you get fluid developing posteriorly, spontaneously, it does occur uh, with certain conditions. People that have nanophthalmos, these are people that are really hyperopic, very short eyes, thick sclera. But it's also been associated with drug use. Uh, uh, topiramate or Topamax has been implicated, and there are warnings about that. Uh, people become a little bit myopic, which indicates their lens iris diaphragm is shifting anteriorly because they're developing uvula fusion. And if it goes even further, now you have angle closure and marked pressure elevation. And again, uh, you don't want to do a laser iodotomy for this type of problem because it's not pupillary block. Um, a, what you want to do is get rid of the aqueous, uh, get rid of the uvula effusion uh, and restore the anterior chamber depth by stopping the offending agent. We think that it may be uh, a kind of a, an allergic response, so some people use steroids uh, for this as well. And then finally, uh, there are inflammatory conditions that lead to uh, uvula effusions. HIV uh, has been implicated uh, as one possibility. And again, uh, keep in mind the uh, Topamax, uh, the topiramate, as a possible offending agent, but there are other ones as well. There's a lengthy list. Many of them are sulfa medications. So Diamox, for example, that we use to lower pressure has also been implicated with this. Um, and let me just finish up and tell you about epithelial uh, and fibrous downgrowth. Um, these are things that you will see uh, after surgery on, on rare occasions. Hopefully you'll never see them. Um, fibrous ingrowth is more benign. It's more limited. But epithelial downgrowth uh, is a very, very uh, aggressive uh, process. So if you truly have these lines growing, and you'll see these fine lines uh, growing across the cornea from whatever surgery you did, cataract surgery, glaucoma surgery, up above, and you get these lines going in, what happens, the cornea decompensates, and this membrane also closes the angle, and you get a very aggressive uh, secondary angle closure glaucoma. This can be treated, you sometimes can salvage the eyes by um, trying to remove the membrane, giving 5-FU intraocularly in a very small dose, cryoing uh, the area of the membrane that you've identified, and you can identify the membrane by applying a laser which blanches um, a white, the membrane, and it gives you a darker color blanch if you're doing on the iris in a non-membrane area. And retinal detachment surgery, whether it's a buckle, can cause ciliary body rotation and cause a problem with angle closure. But more commonly, you can see with silicone oil, which is used for re kind of recalcitrant uh, re renal detachments that are difficult to get on, they put in silicone oil. And silicone oil can give you a pupillary block uh, situation. And oil floats, so the iridectomy that we want to alleviate with the pupillary block is going to be inferior. That's where ideally where it should be placed. And um, unusual causes of angle closure that we talked about is microspherophakia. Um, these you can see with dilation. You can see that these are small lenses. If they have stubby short fingers and they're short stature, think of Will Marcassani. Another really rare thing, which is kind of neat to see, it looks like shredded wheat iris, often inferiorly. These are in older people, um, and this is iridoschisis, and that's been associated with a secondary angle closure as well. So... Um, Aniridia uh, is something that's uh, seen uh, not too rarely here, uh, whether it's on the glaucoma service or in pediatrics. And uh, there are different manifestations of aniridia, uh, and they have sometimes a little bit of iris, sometimes hardly any iris, but even though they have some iris, it does flap up against the angle, and you can get a secondary angle closure with aniridia commonly as well. In terms of uh, basic principles for managing uh, secondary angle closure glaucomas, what I can tell you is that we really have to be masters of gonioscopy. It's such a simple technique, but uh, it's underutilized, and that can really help you out in, in making the diagnosis quickly for a lot of these things, like neovascular glaucoma and ICE syndrome. And then, of course, it can help you treat the underlying problem. Uh, if you pinpoint, for example, as low-grade inflammation, you're going to treat the uveitis promptly. And then also uh, understanding the mechanism of the disease and understanding the therapy, whether it's a pupillary block, uh, doing a laser odotomy, or if it's not a pupillary block, moving on to something else. That's it. Any questions? Great. Thank you.